Welcome to today's webinar on the Health Sensor Platform 3.0, a reference design for personalized healthcare solutions. I'm Katie Wong, an Applications Engineer at Maxim Integrated. Today, I'll be acting as moderator for this webinar. And joining us today is Sudhir Mulpuru. Sudhir joined Maxim Integrated in 2013. He has more than 20 years of experience in the electronics and software industry in roles ranging from sales to product management. In his current role, he is responsible for Maxim's sensor solution initiatives for fitness and wellness wearables. So without further ado, Sudhir, if you would like to begin your presentation. Thank you, Katie. Hello, everyone. Before we get into the health sensor platform and some of its uh, key features, I want to spend a few minutes to discuss the future of personalized healthcare, because this directly ties into the very reason why we designed the reference design. However, before we begin, I wanted to ask you all a quick question. You should see a question on your screen now. Uh, and the question is, are you currently working on any wearable project or involved in any wearable project? I'll give you all a few seconds to answer the question. You can simply click yes or no on your screen. All right, so hopefully that is given enough time for you to answer the question. Let's get started. As you may already know, a global healthcare costs are on the rise. It is currently at $9 trillion, which is 10% of the world's GDP, and it is growing at 2 to 3x the inflation rate. We believe wearables can play a significant role in slowing down the growth uh, increase in the healthcare costs. Wearable remote patient monitoring is gaining momentum, especially uh, in the recent uh, pandemic, as it provides access to health insights, which help both medical professionals and end users to proactively manage uh, preventive care and chronic conditions. We also see a clear shift in the consumer mindset they are moving away from taking care of health when you're sick to a more preventive and proactive uh, mode. Uh, and they're more interested in early detection of uh, health conditions. As a result, what this has done in effect is the consumer's expectations from wearables are also on the rise. They now expect these devices to provide clinical grade accuracy to monitor their health. Also on the sensor technology side, we are now able to add more sensing modalities uh, into wearables, such as heart rate, oxygen saturation, temperature, uh, ECG, electrocardiogram, bioimpedance. So designers can take advantage of sensor fusion technologies to make wearables both smarter and more accurate. Let's take an example of remote patient monitoring and preventive monitoring to see how wearables can play a key role in addressing these areas. Before we move uh, further, let's also take a look at the poll results. Wow, that's quite, uh, co quite a few people who already are working on wearable projects. So uh, you probably recognize with some of the challenges in the healthcare industry. So when you think of remote monitoring, we can broadly classify this into four stages. General predictive monitoring, in-home monitoring, which is also called point of use, in-hospital monitoring, which is point of care, and post-hospital monitoring, which is similar to in-home monitoring. So let's take a simple use case of COVID-19. COVID-19, well, we're all feeling the impact of it, right? It is a very reason why I'm not in Munich in person, but online with you today. According to WHO guidelines, uh, temperature and oxygen saturation and respiration are leading indicators of someone who contracted COVID-19. So by monitoring temperature and SpO2 uh, in a more predictive screening mode, you can not only screen the potential cases, but also isolate 
people that may have come in contact with the potential patients. In addition to temperature and oxygen saturation, or also known as SpO2, monitoring respiration and heart rate is critical in identifying high risk cases. Similarly, wearables can also monitor patients while they are in hospital and also after they are discharged. And as uh, you would have observed, some of these areas uh, or some of these stages require FDA approval, which goes back to my earlier comment about customers' expectations of high accuracy or clinical grade accuracy from wearables. Similarly, on the other hand, when you think about preventive monitoring, it can open up a lot of use cases. Let's take an example of AFib detection. AFib is uh, also known as atrial fibrillation and is one of the most common types of heart arrhythmias. It is an irregular and often rapid heart rate that can increase your risk of strokes, heart failure, and other heart-related complications. According to CDC, uh, AFib causes more than 450,000 hospitalizations every year and contributes to more than 150,000 deaths each year, which is a pretty sad state of affairs. While some people experience and show visible symptoms, others have no noticeable symptoms. It could be completely undiagnosed. So having a wearable and being able to monitor your ECG can help detect and prevent AFib before it can take a serious turn. So as wearables start to address these use cases, whether it is remote patient monitoring or preventive monitoring, and also the, combining that with the change in customer mindset, advancement in sensor technologies, it offers a very unique growth opportunity for wearables. As wearables become more personalized, especially on the preventive care and remote patient monitoring, it is estimated to ship about a billion units in 2023. That's quite a number for wearables. Here is a quick look at the different sensors and sensor technologies that can be used for remote patient monitoring and preventive care. For instance, you can monitor temperature to, uh, under this, uh, and monitor the trends using skin uh, contact temp sensors under the axilla, on the wrist, or other body locations to either detect infectious uh, diseases or very simple fever monitoring. Similarly, on SpO2, or oxygen saturation, this can be used to monitor pulmonary functions and sleep disorders, especially sleep apnea. SpO2 is a great indicator of sleep apnea. Respiration rate, again, can be used for detecting and monitoring respiration trends and detecting any um, anomalies, especially for COVID-19. Respiration is a very key indicator of somebody with COVID-19. Monitoring heart rate trends to understand overall cardiac health and last but not the least is ECG, uh, just like what we talked about for detecting AFib and also overall cardiac health. These vital signs are equally important and used in both the areas we've been talking about, preventive care and remote patient monitoring. Part of Maxim's wearable strategy has been to provide customers with the means to collect their own data to develop new use cases. This is something we embarked on in 2016. We realized wearables is a nascent uh, uh, market and customers and Maxim are learning along the way of how to create new use cases, how to be successful, how to have a meaningful impact in people's lives. So in order to do this, we developed or we started developing platforms to enable development, evaluation, and rapid prototyping. We've started with HSP in 2016 that combined some of our sensors, power management ICs, and MCUs to create, uh, ideally, the, the, uh, 
the idea behind was to create a data collection platform uh, to make it easier for our customers to collect data and not spend a lot of time in building prototypes. It became an instant success with several startups and new market entrants. So in 2018, we embarked on working on HSP 2.0, which is our second generation platform, which was built on the success of HSP. We took a lot of the feedback from our customers from HSP and put it into HSP 2.0. It offered more flexibility, a more convenient form factor, like you can, like you can see in the image there, and it also had a display. Again, it became a, a very successful platform for a lot of our customers, helped a lot of our customers validate use cases because it was a more of a form factor-based platform. And we received a lot of great feedback from customers that gave birth to HSP 3.0. Uh, believe it or not, one of the feedbacks we got from our customers <laughs> of all the things we did was they said we could care less about the display, which made perfect sense. These are not consumer products. These are evaluation platforms. They said we don't need the display. So we took a lot of the feedback and a lot of the uh, comments that uh, from HSP 2.0, and we created HSP 3.0, which is what we want to talk to you today more in detail. Just like its predecessors, HSP 3.0 is an open source and multi-sensor platform that includes ECG, electrocardiogram, a PPG, which stands for photoplethysmography, and a temperature, along with Maxim's wearable PMIC and MCUs. Also, industrial design has a huge impact on the ability to capture the right kind of data or right fidelity, high fidelity data. So one of the things we also improved in HSP 3.0 is the industrial design. We simplified it, made it smaller, lighter, and easier to use it for both prototyping as well as data collection. So let's jump into some of the key features of the platform. So here is a high level block diagram of HSP 3.0 or Health Sensor Platform 3.0. As you can see on the far right, this platform integrates MAX 86176, uh, which is Maxim's latest ECG and PPG AFE. It's a two in one analog front end. And I'll touch on the sensor uh, later on in the presentation. It also integrates Maxim's 0 0.1 degree C temperature sensor, contact temp sensor and an accelerometer. On the host board in the middle of the block diagram, we have MAX 20360. This is our wearable PMIC that is specifically designed for wearables, for, for one, and, for, and second, it has been designed to work with our sensors to provide the best system level SNR. When, as I've seen, more than 45% of the people have experience with designing or involved in wearables, especially if you've dealt with optical wearables, you know SNR is one of the key metrics that can have an impact on the signal quality. So every ounce of the system level SNR has to be carefully designed and orchestrated. So working with our wearable uh, PMIX, we were able to build the power management ICs that can work very well with our AFEs to give you the best SNR possible. As you may have noticed, uh, you should see two MCUs on the host board. The big um, rectangle box in the middle, uh, the first one is a MAX 32666, which is the Maxim's latest M4F MCU with BLE that hosts all the firmware and does all the signal processing. Customers can get access to the source code or the sample code of the host processor. So you can customize it, you can tune it to your specific requirements and use cases. And for customers that need help with algorithms, we've added a second processor, MAX 32670, that acts as an algorithm hub. It is designed to process the raw data through clinical grade algorithms that are offered by Maxim and also our partners like be secure on ECG based algorithms. In addition, the platform streams data to a PC based GUI via BLE. The GUI allows you to collect raw data 
and algorithm outputs or a combination of both for further processing and validation. So you have complete flexibility of controlling the sensors, tuning and uh, or customizing it for your specific use cases. So here is an image of a health sensor platform. Uh, as I mentioned before, industrial design plays a critical role in gathering high fidelity data. As you can see, uh, there is an optical design optimized <clears throat> for heart rate and SpO2 on the back of the watch. The image is the back side of the watch. And I also have the watch with me physically, and I can show it to you as well. <clears throat> Here is a watch. And as you can see, the electrode design is slightly different on my uh, uh, device, but it primarily has an optical com components in the middle that can help you monitor heart rate and SpO2. And we've added two electrodes on either side for ECG, the long rectangular bars. And there's a third electrode on the side of the watch, which I can again show you on my video. So that's the third electrode to close the loop with the finger. And also use a round metal slug. Uh, and this is basically attached to a contact temp sensor to monitor your skin temperature. So I want to uh, highlight an important point here. While the image shows a wrist-based wearable form factor, even the previous slide, we showed you a wrist-based form factor. The reference design can easily be adopted to other locations on the body, including a chest, an abdomen, or forehead. So it's just a matter of taking the uh, electronics inside and redesign, uh, putting together a different shell depending on the use case. The heart of the system is uh, MAX 86176, which I mentioned is one of Maxim's latest ECG and uh, PPG and log front end. So let's take a look at this IC a little bit closer. <clears throat> so here is a block diagram of um, ECG and PPG uh, analog front end that I was talking about. On the PPG side, what you see here is two channels of simultaneous PPG acquisition. And I'll talk about that, why that is important. Uh, it also has an ECG, one lead ECG, a separate uh, signal chain for itself with a right leg drive, and some of the advanced features that help with the overall system level design. It also has a 256 word FIFO and can be interfaced either through an SPI or an I2C, user selectable. Very, very flexible. It's unlike competition, uh, like, like as you can see in the block diagram, it has separate signal chains for both ECG and PPG. So what does this mean for our customers? This means you can synchronize ECG and PPG uh, in a perfect manner, although you can, uh, while running, not although, while running ECG and PPG at different sample rates. To give you an example, I can have my PPG running at 25 samples per second and ECG running at 256 samples per second and still have a perfectly synchronized ECG and uh, PPG signals. Which, are, uh, which can be crucial in monitoring several health-related parameters, but the most common ones are pulse transit time and pulse velocity and time measurements. Uh, we've ha we had several of our customers using our chip to do PDT and PVT measurements, and they're exploring these for monitoring overall cardiac health, but also to see if they can measure blood pressure or trending blood pressure. On the ECG side, uh, we have an active right leg drive, which allows us to get a CMR of 110 dB. Why is this number important? This number is important for several reasons. Number one, if you, if you think about it, this form factor is a dry electrode application. A typical in-hospital monitoring or a clinical setup, uh, remote patient monitoring the patches uses wet electrodes with very good contact to the skin. So getting an ECG with the wet electrodes is relatively easy. It's not easy, it's relatively easy. With the dry electrodes, it makes it so much harder. And on top of that, if you think about the platform, we have two electrodes at the bottom, touching the wrist, and one electrode on the side or at the top, 
which is touching the finger to close the loop. And there is a mismatch in the impedance of the skin on the wrist versus the finger. So now we are dealing with what we call as two different challenges, dry electrodes with mismatched uh, impedances. So having a high CMRR is very critical in getting clinical grade, I, I'm stressing the word clinical grade, clinical grade ECG with dry, electrode, uh, dry electrodes. And uh, like I mentioned uh, on the um, advanced features, uh, we've added what we call as ECG electrode uh, material characterization. And what, what, what this means, it's basically an impedance measurement, that's what it is, but it can be used for ECG electrode characterization. So why does it, why, why, why should customers care about this? The very fact that when you're designing a wearable, you have a choice uh, of different electrode materials. And you, are, you, you probably want to test different electrode materials and understand uh, how they perform. One way of doing it is building several prototypes and testing it on several subjects, collecting data, analyzing the data. The long way of doing it. The short way of doing it is being able to characterize these electrodes using this impedance measurement that is built into the chip to reduce your overall design time and also make more meaningful uh, conclusions of different electrode material choices you have. On the PPG side, uh, as I said, we have two simultaneous readout channels. Um, again, customers should only care about this for two reasons. Number one, it allows you to implement the lowest power heart rate solution out there, period. Number two, it gives you 110 dB SNR, which allows you to cover, get a much, much better coverage for oxygen saturation or SpO2 use cases, especially on the wrist, which is one of the worst locations, by the way. Uh, for, for people that are already involved, probably agree with me on this. Uh, it's one of the worst locations to do uh, any kind of healthcare monitoring, but it's one of the most acceptable form factors, which is why 90% of the market is currently dominated uh, with wrist-based wearable devices. We see a clear trend of wearables coming with different form factors and a shift from wrist, but uh, that's probably going to take another couple of years until we figure out how to deploy these in a very user-friendly fashion. So with that, uh, so now that we have this platform, we have this, uh, 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 like I bragged about, best-in-class and log front end. So let's take a look at what are some of the use cases we can enable out of the box uh, with the health sensor platform. It can be used for, as I said, monitoring heart rate, SpO2. Uh, we can also provide uh, more analytics. And this is only for customers who need some help on algorithms. Customers who don't need help on algorithms, they can extract raw data. They can use the raw data to develop and tune your own algorithms. Uh, on the analytics slide, we can provide sleep, stress scores, and fitness scores. We can do body temperature prediction and AFib uh, detection. AFib detection is, um, AFib detection algorithms, I should say, uh, is through our partnership with B Secure. <clears throat> and uh, with all of this, with the combination of all of this, we think while these are individual uh, health measurements, whether it's heart rate or temperature or SpO2 or ECG or AFib, these are all individual measurements. By combining these, we can start addressing more serious health conditions. To give you an example of what I mean, if you can monitor heart rate and oxygen saturation, you can actually detect sleep apnea, which is a medical condition. And a lot of people uh, have a sleep apnea, which is undiagnosed, which is a multi-billion dollar health crisis. So we think with all of these features and the algorithms and the flexibility and, and uh, the access to the source code and the firmware, we think HSP3 will help our customers with several things. One, faster time to market, which is what we're all up against. Uh, we're, we're all trying to get to that milestone to make a meaningful impact in people's life. This platform should save you at least six months of development time because you don't need to start developing your hardware. It's fully validated hardware. It comes with fully validated firmware and fully validated algorithms. The second and the most important thing for me, at least, is clinical grade accuracy. 
on SPO2 using photoplethysmography or optical sensor, we can meet FDA requirements for SPO2, consumer-grade SPO2. And on the ECG side, uh, this platform as well as a sensor on the platform can meet IEC 60601-2-47, which is the ambulatory ECG specs. It's a very small size, as you can see. It's, again, on my video. I don't know if you're able to see my video, but it's a very small form factor. It goes very well on the wrist. And it's a complete reference design uh, with access to, like I mentioned, source code and other design files that you can take and make it your own. We hope uh, you've learned um, uh, how Maxim is enabling personalized healthcare by meeting the demands of remote patient monitoring, like we talked about, uh, which in turn enables better uh, preventive and predictive uh, healthcare, and also chronic disease uh, management, like sleep apnea we discussed about. So with that, I will turn it over to Katie to open it up for questions. Thank you, Sudhir, for that informative presentation. Before we start Q&A, I want to draw your attention to the Contact Us window on your screen. If you'd like additional info beyond what was covered today, please fill out this form and we will reach out to you. All right, moving swiftly on to Q&A, we have a lot of good questions that have come in. Uh, the first one is, do you have any FDA or medical certifications for this platform? Great question. Uh, again, when you think about uh, FDA, you need, to, uh, you need to think about it. Uh, from an end-user standpoint. Typically, the FDA certification is at an end device. It, it's, it's typically done at a device level. This is not a consumer device that you can deploy uh, in the field. This is designed as a platform for our customers to take advantage of. And so we have, uh, on the SPO2 or on the ECG side, we are doing all the tests as though we would be getting an FDA certification to see if we meet those requirements. On SPO2, we, we've actually gone to a hypoxia lab because unlike heart rate, if I just stand up and start walking, my heart rate goes up. With the SPO2 oxygen saturation, the only way to calibrate your device is to go to an independent lab called hypoxia lab where they change your nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon dioxide levels to reduce your oxygen levels from 100% to almost 70%. It's a medically supervised lab. So we went to an independent hypoxia lab to test our algorithms to see if they meet uh, FDA requirements. So what we're able to show at the platform is that we can meet, our, uh, make and meet FDA requirements, but taking our reference design and sub going through the test at a device level and going to FDA approval is unfortunately uh, on the customer side. We would love to help more, but <laughs> our, tie, uh, our hands are tied of how far we can go with the reference design. Okay, our next question is, how can I get the Algorithm Hub Max32670 software like .msbl files for Max32664 Hub? Great question. 32664 for people who don't know, uh, who've, not, who've not seen that part number on this presentation, is our uh, previous version of uh, Sensor Hub or Algorithm Hub. 32670 is, is a follow on to that product. And the reason we did this was uh, 32664 was a much smaller MCU, which had much, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but had a much smaller memory. So we were not able to squeeze all our algorithms into one MCU. So we had to develop a larger uh, memory footprint MCU so we can integrate ECG, uh, our uh, heart rate, SpO2, blood pressure algorithms, all of them into a single MCU. So that is the biggest advantage. So. In terms of backward compatibility, it will be a little bit of a challenge because of the size of the MSPL file uh, that will go into the 32670. But uh, we expect to have it on our website for customers to download uh, in the near future. We are currently working on it. Um, when the health sensor platforms are shipped to the customer, this MSPL file will be preloaded. But as we are making more updates, the newer versions will be made available on our website. Okay. Our next question is, is it possible to monitor blood pressure in a wearable form factor? Great question. Great question. So uh, this is uh, actually uh, a, a very good question. Uh, we have seen several customers, including Maxim, trying to 
attempt to address this uh, <laughs> million dollar question, can we monitor blood pressure accurately on a wearable device? So there are different technologies customers are exploring. Some of our customers or partners are exploring PTT, PVT, the pulse transit time uh, based techniques. Uh, we've seen customers using optical uh, to do uh, blood pressure monitoring as well. And we do have blood pressure algorithms that we are working on. And this is all public information. Uh, you, can, you can get them on Maxim's website as well uh, that are finger-based. Uh, the first gen algorithms are going to be finger-based. And uh, basically uh, the idea again, I, I don't know if this makes sense in your use case, but the idea is to be able to take uh, the optical device, if you're able to see my screen, and be able to take the wrist-based device wearable off of the wrist and put your finger on to be able to monitor blood pressure. That is the use case Maxim is going after for, for Gen 1, and that is what we've introduced uh, on our website as well. Uh, so, uh, again, we don't have a final solution that we can give you because as soon as you say blood pressure, we also need to be careful here. As soon as you say blood pressure or systolic, diastolic numbers, it's FDA-regulated market. So there is a lot more regulatory work that, that needs to happen before a blood pressure will be enabled in the wearable form. But a lot of work is going into it, and I'm uh, very confident uh, in, the next, in the near future we are going to see wearables that can detect uh, blood pressure. And uh, I'll be one of the early customers to adopt it. My parents need it. My wife needs it. I need it. And so it's, it's, a, it's a use case that, that a lot of customers, including Maxim, are chasing to solve. Okay, our next question. How does the platform communicate with the PC? Oh, great question. So I don't know if you caught on in the presentation, uh, the PC-based GUI uh, is uh, talking to, or the platform is talking to the PC-based GUI using Bluetooth communication. So we have our host processor, Max32666, if you remember. Uh, this is our Maxim's latest MCU with Bluetooth uh, integrated in it. All right. Uh, that appears to be all the questions that we have for today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us, and thank you for your great questions. Thank you again to our presenter, Sudhir Mulpuru. Uh, if your question was not answered during the webinar, we will answer it via email. And after the webcast ends, there will be a pop-up on your screen for an opportunity to request a meeting with our team. Thank you for joining us.